This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Tired of cheerleaders and phony media issues? We treat climate change almost as if it's something external. It's a sort of problem that we've created that we can solve with human genius. But I don't think it is. I think climate change is our society. Climate change is who we are. Looking for the awful truth? Dig in with Alex Smith. Actually, you're never going to get millions of people on the streets to campaign against climate change because they'll be campaigning against their own way of life. And so we're all complicit in that system. The voters are complicit, the corporations are complicit, the politicians are complicit, and we might want to stop climate change, but actually I don't think that we can, at least within the time scale that's apparently available to us. And I think we need to be honest about that, because only when we're honest about that can we start to think about what we do next. Top scientists, authors, and activists, the ones you want to hear. No fear, Deep Green Radio EcoShock. Join us. Great scientists on Radio EcoShock warn us the ecological future is breaking bad. What are we supposed to think about that? From time to time, I like to connect with bright minds to thrash it through. I'm pleased to welcome back Sean Chamberlain from the UK. Sean is no stranger to science. He edited publications. He's worked with science. He's advised groups from Chelsea Green Publishing to the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change. Sean co-authored a report to Parliament on carbon rationing, and he co-founded Transition Town Kingston. Lately, Sean is in charge of the Fleming Policy Centre, and we'll talk about what that is, and he continues his seminal work in his blog, Dark Optimism. Sean Chamberlain, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. Uh, Always a pleasure, Alex. Well, after years of publishing articles and working on transition, you recently got your first arrest, Civil Disobedience for the Climate, what happened and why now? Ah, right. Yeah, this was with the Extinction Rebellion. And to be honest, I came to a point where I wasn't quite sure what was next, because as you say, for well, well over a decade now, I've been doing everything I could to raise the alarm about the ecological catastrophe that's unfolding around us, and as indeed you have. And we see the, <laughs> the consequences piling up and the response is not. And so I'd sort of resolved to take a bit of a breather and a step back and figure out you know, what it would make sense to do in these times when uh, Extinction Rebellion came across my radar about, would have been about the middle of 2018. And yeah, there was something there that really piqued my interest. And I went along on Halloween last year to the Declaration of Rebellion in Parliament Square. And the idea was that maybe 30 people would come and just symbolically announce that We were no longer willing to stand by and watch governments possibly end life on Earth in our names. And actually around a thousand of us turned up. And that was very interesting. And the people who turned up seemed to really understand what was going on. And it was a deeply refreshing and nourishing day, actually. And then plans were being hatched for bigger actions. Like in November, we blockaded the six bridges around the Houses of Parliament in London for an entire day. Uh, about 7,000 of us took those bridges and basically were too many people for the police to arrest. And I suppose personally, I found that, I suppose it works on, on two levels for me. On, on one level, it's just a way of expressing as, a, as an animal, if you like, as a human being to say, you know, it can be quite the disconnect between the, the profound feelings that I have about the state of what's unfolding and then sort of writing an article or, or doing an interview, it seems very abstract. And there's something really quite satisfying about sort of putting your body on the line and, and sort of sitting in front of the machine, as it were, metaphorically, and saying, I'm not going to move. <laughs> and if someone wants to make me move, they're physically going to have to move me. On an animal level, I found that to be something quite satisfying. And then also, you know, a lot of evidence shows from people much more involved with the origins of Extinction Rebellion and me, that whenever we've seen dramatic shifts in society, mass civil disobedience has been a really big part of that. Um, You know, whether that's the civil rights movement, whether that's anti-apartheid, whether that's the suffragettes. And it's true that in many ways what we're facing now is, is a bigger challenge in that all of those movements were about taking a set of rights that already applied to one set of people and extending them to others, whereas what we're really talking about is a is a fundamental challenge to our economic order and our societal order. But nonetheless, I think it still makes sense to study what the most powerful movements of our past have achieved and how they've achieved that. And uh, I've been very impressed with Extinction Rebellion's analysis of how we might 
make a difference. And one of the things that they found in talking to the media is that if you get a lot of people arrested, you get headlines. And if you get headlines, people hear about it. And if people hear about it, then they have a chance to get involved. And from that first week or so of action back in November, uh, I think around 150 of us were arrested in London over that week or so. Uh, now, because of the coverage that I got, I would say there are rebellions happening or being organized in, I think, over 50 countries worldwide. And um, I'm sure you and your listeners will have heard about it from, from many different angles. So it's quite exciting in a way to see to see this no, really, this just absolute no <laughs> being expressed by a lot of people. And, and I think what I found especially interesting, having been involved with things like the Dark Mountain movement before, which I'm sure some of your listeners are familiar with, is that I was invited to give a talk on the on, uh, on Blackfriars Bridge on the day that we blockaded the bridges. And one of the things I spoke about then was that I honestly don't think we are going to head off catastrophic climate change. And I wanted to speak to the others who were on that bridge who, who maybe felt the same way. And to answer the, the obvious question, well, you know, what are you doing here then? And what I found very interesting in the response is that a lot of people have come up to me and said, wow, that really touched me and that's really been a meaningful thing to me. And let, we, really, we need to build grief into the heart of the work that Extinction Rebellion is doing because, you know, the suffering and the consequences are already coming home for a lot of people and a lot of other species. And that's so different from context I've been in before where if you voice that fear, which probably everyone present is carrying but nobody's allowed to talk about, then the response I've tended to get before is, oh, you can't say that, you know, we've got to keep hope, we've got to keep positive. But in this context, it seems like we're allowed to actually talk about things and decide what it makes sense to do in that context rather than operating from a sort of uh, enforced collaborative consensus denial, one might say. Right, but I think there is a trap here that we have to avoid. I mean, I totally support the Extinction Rebellion. We've had an interview just recently with Rupert Reed and uh, Alison Green. But there is a very small group of people who are saying we will all be dead by 2035. And I just read a blog post from a blog that I have followed for years saying, well, no, it's going to be 2021. We'll all be extinct by then. And I, I think that's just kind of nuts, actually. I agree. I completely agree. Um, I think that there is no, absolutely no shortage of urgency here, but we don't need to get into this strange sort of Duma contest that we seem to be in where people want to make their name by being even more extravagantly horrified or, or predicting doom even sooner than the last person. Um, I mean, obviously, there are certain scenarios, particularly involving nuclear weapons, where we could certainly uh, <laughs> do some serious damage in a seriously short time scale, but... In terms of the climate science, I think those timescales are, are completely absurd, as you say, and, and a number of your guests and interviews have, I think, evidenced how absurd that is. Now, we recently interviewed the Australian biologist Corey Bradshaw, and he suggested that we may see a mass reduction of human population one way or another. Is that worth talking about? You mean over a longer time period? Yes. Yeah, well, that I think absolutely is worth talking about, because... I mean, you, you don't have to look very far into ecology and biology to realize that when populations massively overshoot their carrying capacity, then, then they tend to come back down again um, for fairly fundamentally obvious reasons. So I think when we're not just uh, abstractly and hypothetically talking about the future of, of our world and our society, but also when we're thinking about our, you know, when I'm thinking about my life and what decisions to take about my direction and what kind of context I'm likely to be living into, I think it absolutely makes sense to think that the future which is mapped out for us in, uh, in the mainstream, you know, in the media and in, in the adverts and in the whole consensus assumption about what the future is going to hold, I think it absolutely makes sense to question whether that's realistic. And in fact, I, I would say at the moment, that's a, a really active challenge for me in that on the one hand, there is that sort of social consensus and, and that most of my friends and family and, and peer groups hold. And as a consequence, that has a real influence on me and, and the assumptions that I have. But at the same time, on a, on a sort of rational level, I look at those assumptions about the future and I find them profoundly implausible. And it's, yeah, a really active work for me to try and integrate those two sides of myself. Because if I don't do that, then 
I'm going to end up making decisions which I'm, I'm probably going to come to regret because <laughs> things will unfold in a way that one part of me will be saying, yeah, I knew that was coming, and the other part will just be uh, holding my head in my hands, I suppose. So, yeah, I think absolutely with population, we should not be assuming that we are going to avoid a significant reduction in the number of people on the planet over certainly the next century or two. Got to happen, in my opinion. Now, you know, many people are tired of talking about big picture fears and and are looking directly towards local action. You visited Mark Boyle in Ireland. What is he up to? (laughs) I'm there right now, actually. And so Mark is uh, often known as the moneyless man. He uh, wrote a book about, about a decade ago about living for a few years without any money at all down near Bristol in the southwest of England. And now he's sort of looking at what it would look like to live in a way which, I suppose for him what's important is living in a way which has integrity. And, you know, even things like living off grid, he looked at, you know, how the solar panels are made, for example, and he thought, well, that doesn't really seem to be something that has profound systemic integrity to it either. And so he's basically given up electricity and a lot of what we might call high technology and living in a cabin that he built himself from the local woods. And yeah, it's actually a wonderful, a wonderful place to be. And he's he's got a book coming out in the next next month or two, I think, called uh, The Way Home. And one of the things we've been talking about sitting around the sitting around the wood burner here is how you know people talk about giving things up, you know, giving up electricity, giving up technology. And he was drawing the analogy to alcohol and saying, you know, people say, oh, you've given up alcohol, but you don't really do that in order to give up alcohol per se, you do that in order to improve your health and to improve your relationships and probably to improve your financial position. It's all the things that have gone out of your life to make way for alcohol that you're reclaiming. And that's what he's found with technology is that as he in the past became more and more wedded to his phone, his laptop, etc., he lost the relationships with the local natural world, with his local ecosystem, and that over the past couple of years, few years that he's been living this way, Again, he's he's rediscovering what it is to know, you know, not just, oh, there's a magpie, but, you know, there's that magpie, <laughs> there's that individual who I know um, that I have a relationship with. Here's the changing of the seasons represented in ways that actually really have brought him back to, uh, I suppose going back to what I said earlier, a, a way of being and feeling fully human in a way that he hadn't realized how much he missed until he uh, until he got it back in many ways. Um, and having read an advanced copy of his book, I, I wholeheartedly recommend it. It's a, a profound meditation both on what it is to be human and what it is to, to live in these times specifically, I would say. We'll look for Mark Boyle's book for sure. I did that to some degree. I sort of built a cabin and uh, lived without electricity for about 10 years. So say hello to Mark from me. Uh, but now I'm back in the <laughs> thick of it and uh, we're broadcasting worldwide and using electricity and all that stuff. Uh, it's hard to leave. It keeps sucking you back in. That's what I find. Mm. Well, I think he finds that too. I mean, right now he's actually not here because he's uh, traveled down to Kinsale to give a talk there about his, his forthcoming book. And of course, I mean, this is a, a tension. I mean, he's he's my best friend and this is a tension that he and I have, have grappled with for many years is, you know, on, on the one hand, the desire to just live in a way that, you know, that makes sense to, to you as an individual or as a community. Uh, on the other hand, the desire to communicate something of this, because I think certainly I've in the past been in a situation where I didn't know that anyone was living in a way that wasn't the mainstream. And certainly for me, at times, it's been profoundly inspiring to discover examples of people who were, you know, either living in a particular way or writing or thinking in a particular way. And, and the, 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 the deep refreshment it brings to encounter these ideas being lived wholeheartedly lends a certain motivation to actually communicate what you're doing. But then in doing so, as you say, you get kind of, you get kind of sucked back in, don't you? And I don't think there's an absolute resolution to that. And if there was, I suspect you would have found it by now, Alex, but um, you have to sort of live that dance between, between doing what, what you're called to do and, um, and sharing that with the wider world so that you can discover your, your allies and, uh, and build it together. Radio EcoShock. This is Radio Ecoshock. We're talking with Sean Chamberlain. Back in December 2016, we broadcast an introduction to your work with the late David Fleming. Sean, just remind us who David was and why you have spent years getting his writing out to the broader public. Yeah, I mean, this does feel like the most valuable thing, the most worthwhile thing I've done with my life to date, to be honest. Um, David Fleming was 
a sort of um, elder of the ecological movement here in the UK. He was involved in starting the Green Party here. Uh, he was a chair of Soil Association, which is our organic growers' body. Uh, he was involved in the foundation, I think, of the New Economics Foundation. Uh, he was one of the early whistleblowers on, on peak oil and the energy crisis, one of the inspirations behind the Transition Towns movement. And he was a, a historian and, in the end, an economist, because when he was bringing his sort of ecological me- message back in the 70s, he was constantly being told by economists that it was unrealistic. And so he went and got himself a PhD in economics just to, uh, to prove them wrong on their own ground, as it were. And his life's work was this uh, astonishing book called Lean Logic, a Dictionary for the Future and How to Survive It, which is indeed a dictionary, a sort of Wikipedia-style linked dictionary. And uh, he never quite got it published before his death, his very sudden death in 2010. And he was a good friend of mine, and a mentor to me. So after his death, I brought that book to publication and also uh, a book that I edited out from it called Surviving the Future, Culture, Carnival and Capital in the Aftermath of the Market Economy, which is a, a sort of more conventional read it front to back paperback book. And I think maybe what's most compelling about uh, David's work, certainly what most excites me about it, is that it offers a solution to the the impossible bind we seem to find ourselves in around economic growth, where currently we're in the situation whereby if we if we don't continue to grow our economy, it will collapse. And if we do continue to grow our economy, it will collapse the ecology on which it depends. And this sort of vast dilemma, I would say, is underpins situations like climate change, um, having been involved with policy work here in the UK and seen that essentially when you try and put any kind of meaningful cap on emissions, effectively that work gets stomped on because it would be contrary to the to the mandates of economic growth. I was desperately looking for some kind of some kind of answer to this situation and uh, and David's work provides it. Um, he looked historically at how economies ran and how societies thrived before this couple of hundred years of, of growth-based economies. And to summarize someone's life's work down to a sentence or two, I would say that in his view, essentially in the absence of economic growth, what sustains human civilizations is culture, actually. Music, play, carnival, all of these things that bond people together are the ways in which people spent their time when they weren't forced to be working full time and, and every hour God sends in order to, to pay their bills and their rent. And because people would spend their time in those ways, it gave them A, something to live for, but B, a reason to care about each other so that in difficult times, they wouldn't look to money for their security, but would look to each other for their security. And that's why I'm doing the work I'm doing now in many ways, because if I would distill down David's message about what it makes sense to do in these times, there would be two answers. And one would be preserving and and regenerating the ecology, which in a sense is the only economic system that's ever worked, nature, uh, because it produces all our resources and food and water and oxygen and all the other economic and political systems are really just toying with the surplus that nature has gifted us. So trying to keep nature from being utterly degraded and destroyed as is the current trend makes a lot of sense for any kind of potential future that we're facing. And the other thing that makes sense, as I hinted at, is is rebuilding what he calls the informal economy, the non-monetary economy, the economy of that which we love, the economy of all the things that we do when we're not being paid for or, or re- required to do a particular thing, our you know, family time and, and music and volunteering and teaching our kids you know, how to speak and eat and play and all of the things that we do when, yeah, when we're not otherwise compelled. And that informal economy and the natural ecology are really the two systems on which all of human history has developed, other than this brief historical anomaly that we're currently living through, where we live under this myth that money is fundamentally what we need to survive. And with this sort of dangerous concept of um, financial independence, which is held up as this admirable or even obligatory thing for us to achieve in our lives, that I would argue is actually a complete myth, um, that if someone is, is rich enough to, to pay for their, their house and their food and everything else, well, somebody else still grew that food and delivered it. Somebody else still built that house. Somebody else still fueled it. Um, and all that money really allows us to do is to be dependent on people that we don't know, rather than being dependent on people that we do know. And I think many of us have found that that is actually an impoverishment rather than an enhancement of our lives. 
so yeah, rebuilding the informal economy and rebuilding the ecology are the things that seem to David and seem to me to make sense. And of course, you know, Extinction Rebellion is, is very much about the uh, protect those ecological assets on which we're all utterly dependent. You've just touched on, I think, something that is a deep yearning for myself and for most of our listeners, that ability to reconnect and to have some meaning outside the idea. I mean, the Americans are always bragging, well, we've got low unemployment, but people are working three jobs. There seems to be something in this system, the industrial system, that doesn't want you to have that free time, doesn't want you to have any days off, doesn't want you to get together on your own without needing the bankers. And that's shocking that we've come to that. Well, you're right. And it, it, I mean, it's actually fascinating. Um, you know, when, once, you, once you sort of click about the problems of the economic growth paradigm and you see that, you know, what all the politicians are saying is we've got to keep growth high, keep unemployment low. And, you know, it's, these, these are absolute goods if you, if you pay attention to, uh, you know, the mainstream media and the mainstream politics. But it's really interesting once you start to think about that. You know, what is full-time employment? Well, in many ways, it's, it's a complete absence of spare time, which is something that most of us might think of as a, as a desirable part of, of a life well lived, you might say. I mean, some another thing that really comes out in, in David Fleming's work is he notes the startlingly extensive holidays that people enjoyed in the Middle Ages. You know, five months of the year in some place were, were leisure time. Um, and so you think, well, how come? You know, we're living in this incredibly technologically advanced society Machines are doing so much of the work. How come we're all working harder than ever? It doesn't seem to make sense. And David really explained this to me, that in a competitive market economy like we've got, which we didn't have for most of human history, but which we do have now, it's really hard to sustain, uh, say, a three-day working week, for example. And people are constantly, I mean, you hear it nowadays, and you've been hearing it for hundreds of years, people saying, oh, well, technology is going to allow us to live in this leisure-rich utopia where, you know, luxury communism is one of the latest, latest terms for it, that we just won't have to work so hard because machines are going to do it all. But that doesn't work in a market economy because if I decide to work a three-day working week, for example, well, any other individuals who decide to work full-time will be able to produce a greater quantity of goods and services of whatever it is they're making and thus earn the same wage by selling each one more cheaply. And so the, the sort of more competitive people, if you like, would be fully employed and they put the likes of me out of business completely. And as, as David writes in Surviving the Future, this is what puts the grim into reality is that our, our economic system simply doesn't allow us to have more leisure time, no matter how much technology advances. So sort of counterintuitively, technological advances actually become a, become a problem, really, in our economy because they tend to put lots of the workers out of work. And because people only know how to support themselves via the financial economy, they just become a drain on the state looking for, looking for benefits or, or, you know, or starving to death, ultimately. And in theory, it might be true that all the workers could just work half-time and produce all that's needed, but they can't do that because there's no sense of solidarity there. There's no sense of community. So in practice, they're afraid of losing their jobs to that stranger who's willing to work longer hours or, or just having their pay cut to the bone by their employers. And so we end up with this situation where, yeah, because of our economic system, not because of a lack of technology, not because of a lack of resources, not because of a lack of money, but because of the economic system that we've chosen, it becomes almost obligatory to work in just the way that you're describing. And that, again, is, is why it's so exciting that David has held out a vision which is not just, you know, an answer to the fear of what we might lose, but in many ways is a, an answer to how we might reclaim what we've lost already, which is that sense of, uh, yeah, that sense of a life in which we have time to, to live rather than just to survive. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll just tweet that out, I'll create a headline, I'll make a Facebook post, and then I'll think, I'm a real climate activist, but... Is online activism an oxymoron? Wow, that's a question. Well, there's a role for online organizing, I guess, but it definitely has a tendency to take over, <laughs> to become all that we do, as you say, to stick out a Facebook page and feel like, well, I've done my bit. And I have to say that one of the things that really was an interesting experience about being arrested for the first time in my life uh, a few months ago was that when I was put in a jail cell, and I was sitting, sitting in that cell and, and sort of reflecting on what I'd done. I'd always been told that, you know, that I'd sort of feel ashamed or guilty or whatever if I, if I found myself in that scenario. 
And in many ways, I found quite the opposite. And I suppose it's because I knew why I was there and I believed in why I was there and I thought about what the potential punishments might be and I'd made my peace with those. So in a way, all it was 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 sitting in a room with the door closed. But something really came back to me, which was uh, something that's been said by a number of people who impressed me, actually, from from Tim to Christopher, the climate activist, uh, Enric Duran, who did an amazing action around... uh, borrowing hundreds of thousands of euros from banks and then not paying them back and donating them all to anti-capitalist causes. Um, And these different people, when they've been in jail, have said that in that situation, they discovered paradoxically a freedom, that their whole life they had limited what they felt they were able to do in accordance with the law. Whereas at this point, they'd found that they'd actually acted completely in accordance with their conscience, in true freedom. And they'd been arrested for it and they'd been locked up. But the sense of freedom that they had in not allowing their choices to be constrained by someone else's laws was actually greater than any diminishing of freedom that was brought about by the bars in front of them. And this is, this is one of the things that I was talking about on that, on that bridge um, outside Westminster in London. And I, uh, I always come back to Wendell Berry, actually. He's one of my, one of my favorite writers, the Kentucky farmer and writer. Uh, and he said that, uh, protest that endures, I think, is moved by a hope far more modest than that of public success, namely the hope of preserving qualities in one's own heart and spirit that would be destroyed by acquiescence. And that really hits home for me, and I don't think sharing a tweet or a Facebook page would preserve those qualities in my heart and spirit. There's something about getting out there on the streets putting one's body on the line, or at least being there shoulder to shoulder with others who are also standing up for what they believe, that, again, it comes back to what's human and what's something very human about being there with others in solidarity, which just doesn't come through a computer screen. So, you know, I'm glad that people are sharing information about all of this stuff online, but I really, really hope that doing that leads people to get out and meet others and act together rather than just uh, go around this, this, as you say, endless cycle of, of clicking and clicking and clicking and suddenly waking up one day and wondering why we didn't actually do anything. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. You are tuned to Radio Ecoshock. I'm Alex with my guest from the UK, Sean Chamberlain. Sean is widely published and currently directs the Fleming Policy Center. We are talking about, well, everything. And, Sean, both the great world powers, the former great world powers, the United Kingdom and America, are in political turmoil, approaching gridlock these days. And that's just at the very time when our energy future and our climate need powerful collective action. Why do you think big government breakdown is happening? I'm a big fan of Leopold Kaur's little tenet, and he said, whenever anything is wrong, the problem is that something is too big. And I am of the opinion that large-scale government doesn't work, whether it's monarchy or whether it's capitalism or whether it's communism or whatever system you care to try. All you can do at the really large scale is, is patch things up. And one of the ways that we patch things up is with this huge energy bonanza that we've had over the past few hundred years, this this ancient sunlight that we've been harnessing and burning up at an absurd rate. And ultimately, we are going to have to, whether we like it or not, face the physical reality that just like every other species on the Earth, we only work at what people still call the human scale, you know, because it is the human scale. We're just somehow in this brief period of transcending and overshooting it. Yeah, certainly... Rob Hopkins' favorite line from from David's work is that localization stands at best at the limits of practical possibility, but it has the decisive argument in its favor that there is no alternative. And yeah, that pretty much sums it up for me. I think that, you know, there's an awful lot to be said about the finer details of the different great political structures in our world, but ultimately, um, in the absence of huge energy inputs. It's going to be about relocalization. And in fact, we um, are just in the process of launching a film called The Sequel, the subtitle to which is What Will Follow Our Troubled Civilization. So yeah, uh, Peter Buffett, uh, the son of Warren Buffett, the the investor, and I think one of the richest men in the world, has 
fallen madly for David Fleming's Surviving the Future, which he described as the book he's been waiting for for the past 20 years, and we're talking about ways in which um, he could support in helping that work spread throughout the world. And indeed, he um, helped fund the, the film that we're launching, the sequel. That is an exciting possibility for bringing this very important work to a much wider audience, hopefully. Where can we find the film, the sequel? The sequel is being distributed by a group called uh, Bullfrog Films. And if you just go to Bullfrog Films and search on the sequel, I think it's bullfrogfilms.com, then uh, you'll find it very easily. It's currently uh, on release to educational institutions and grassroots groups who want to organize group screenings. Um, So a license for a screening, I think, is $79. And later in the year, it will be released for you know, individual DVDs and streaming, etc. Excellent. I'll get that word out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Peter's actually an interesting guy. I've been getting to know him over the last year or so. And uh, he, um, you know, uh, to be honest, if I, because, you know, he inherited a bunch of money from his dad, basically. And uh, to be honest, if I'd found myself in the position of, that he did of inheriting a bunch of money, huge amount of money in that way, um, I'd like to think that I'd have done with it half as well as he has, because I think what his Nova Foundation is doing is, is glorious, really. The Nova Foundation? So, uh, Nova Foundation, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, they're focused on, they're focused on uh, sort of supporting girls and women worldwide and, uh, and on local, local living communities, I think, is, is the thread that, you know, that the, the clothing is what's going on. But he says he's been basically giving Surviving the Future to everyone he knows. Um, and he's a, he's a composer as well. He's a, a Emmy award-winning composer. And he described it to me as apparently on a, on, a, on a tape, there's a little, I forget what it's called, but there's a little magnetic thing which aligns all the ions in the tape to sort of prepare it for recording. And, uh, and he says he thinks of Surviving the Future as being like that. If someone wants to work with him, he gives them a copy of the book. And, uh, you know, if they run away screaming, then they probably weren't someone he wanted to work with. <laughs> if, if they get where it's coming from, then, uh, then he sees that as being a, a good sign. And he's just done a... Um, he's based in Kingston, New York, Kingston, New York State. And he, um, he's just done a radio show over the past, I don't know, six months or so, I guess, where uh, he played a chapter from the audio book, which I recorded of Surviving the Future last year, um, we played a chapter each week and then we'd discuss it with his audience, trying to sort of, yeah, find new ways of, of disseminating these ideas. Because uh, we could mention Surviving the Future Book Club, I guess that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, that's, um, that's what he's been calling it, yeah. Because I think it's very easy for people to look at the world and say, oh, well, it's not sustainable. And, and to treat sustainability as though, you know, as though it's this sort of desirable but unachievable add-on, which seems to be how most sort of businesses see it. But of course, if something's unsustainable, it's, it's going to end. And, um, and indeed, sustainability isn't even really a very ambitious goal. I, I mean, if sustainability is, is the midpoint between destructiveness and regenerativeness, then, uh, then we're not really aiming very high if we aim for sustainability and say it's unachievable. And I, think it was, uh, I think it was Toby Hemingway who said, uh, if someone asks how your marriage is doing, and you say, nah, sustainable. <laughs> you know, it's really, it's really not that great. We can surely do better than that. And so if we're living in a society that can't achieve sustainability, it seems to me that the obvious glaring question is, well, what happens next? You know, what comes after? And our film, very much drawing on, on David Fleming's work, is all about exploring that, like what, what might a, a localized, more resilient sequel look like, not because we all see the light and suddenly move in a more sustainable direction, because, because I honestly don't see that unfolding in front of me, but because our current systems hit the buffers in the way that they're headed for, uh, we head into a collapse type scenario, but it's, that's not literally not the end of the world, despite the apocalyptic doomsday scenarios that we were both uh, talking about earlier. I mean, the one very memorable line that my, my friend Paul Kings, North of the Dark Mountain, said to me was, in many ways, history is a history of apocalypses. Um, I mean, if you're a Native American, the apocalypse has already happened for your society. If you're a, an ancient Roman, ancient Egyptian, the apocalypse has already happened for your society. And the apocalypse that's coming for ours is very unlikely to be the end of life on Earth, the end of humanity on Earth. Uh, it may well be a far more difficult time that's unfolding in front of us in many ways. But it could also be a more, a more satisfying one where we actually 
tell stories with our lives that we can be thoroughly proud to tell, uh, which, to my eyes, is the meaning of life. That's it. Whereas our, our current society seems to encourage us towards this sort of joyless, hollow, isolated consumption and tell us that we're successes. Um, so what might, what might uh, a better future look like post-collapse? And really that's what, uh, yeah, what our film, The Sequel, tries to explore. All right. Now, in the meantime, big governments are offering us something called the Green New Deal. Could that be real? Well, real is a very good word that you've chosen there, Alex, I think, because for me, the, the fundamental challenge that things like the Green New Deal are facing is this huge rift in realism. That on the one hand, you've got the physical reality of, to take one example, the unfolding climate situation, which you know, is worsening extremely rapidly. On the other hand, you've got a completely different reality, which is political reality, which says that anything remotely in line with what physical science is demanding is completely unrealistic. And so you've got this strange situation where you've got people on on both sides calling each other unrealistic. (laughs) And in a way, they're both right, but they're both talking about two completely different realities. It was very interesting, that clip of one of your US senators, is it? Feinstein, I think, was arguing with some young people about the uh, the Green New Deal, and she was saying, well, you know, I've been in politics 30 years, and I, I can see that this isn't going to pass, and you need to trust me and let me deal with it, you know, be more realistic. And these children were saying, well, hang on, <laughs> you know, if we're realistic in the way that you're encouraging, then we aren't going to have a future at all. Um, and again, that they didn't quite frame it this way, but it seemed to me this this real ever more explicit collision between these, these two notions of what, which reality people are referring to. So now whenever anyone says they're a realist, I always immediately ask them which reality it is that they swear their allegiance to. And the Green New Deal, I think, is, is a great thing in that it's really shifting political reality significantly closer to physical reality, and that is an achievement and a significant achievement. Um, and to do that, it's using a lot of the the kind of talking points, the rhetoric of this need for actual reality to do what's necessary to bite the bullet. In practice, I very much suspect that it will have to negotiate with political reality if it's actually going to be implemented. I know that there's an organization in America called the Climate Mobilization who I've been in contact with, and they've been arguing for a sort of World War II style mobilization around climate. Um, bringing in systems like the, the carbon rationing system that David Fleming invented, created back in the back in the mid '90s, as an attempt to deal with the climate situation, uh, and which, which was the subject of the UK government feasibility study over here, which I advised. And I strongly suspect, given that the Green New Deal is the Green New Deal bill has got advocates, I think I think every Democratic presidential candidate has um, has endorsed it. And I strongly suspect that there comes a point where presidential candidates have to be very careful about uh, what they also suspect that they are not going to be able to go up and stand on a platform of uh, ending economic growth, for example. I would argue that it's going to be impossible to address climate change without challenging the economic growth paradigm. But I really, really struggle to see a presidential candidate in, in the US in a few years standing on that platform. And so... I don't believe that the Green New Deal is going to be able to bridge that rift between the two realisms. It's almost certainly, well, if it holds its allegiance to physical reality, then it probably won't get through politics and will never get implemented. If it concedes to political reality, then it won't be adequate to the climate situation. But that is not to demean it. Um, I think, as I said, it's the work is to reconcile those two realities. Um, obviously, if we fail to do that, then it's physical reality that's going to pull rank um, and that's going to do the reconciliation in the hardest possible way. Uh, somebody said that with, with climate change, we have three options. There's mitigation, adaptation and suffering. And at the moment, we're putting all our eggs in the suffering basket. And really what the Green New Deal is, I think, successfully doing is closing that rift a little and bringing political reality a bit closer physical reality. And for that reason, it has my full support, but I strongly suspect that it will not be able to close the gap in one fell swoop. And there you have it, listeners, another example of dark optimism, I think.
<laughs> Quite. <laughs> yeah. So, look, you mentioned the youth, and we have Greta Thunberg, the young Swede, uh, inspiring school strikes for climate action. And I'm sure she's pleased with the wave of agreement around the world. But if you listen to what she actually says, Greta doesn't want the whole climate mess to be left to her generation. She wants the supposed adults to start slashing carbon now. And it just seems like such a cop out to say, oh, look, the kids are doing it now. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I met, I believe, uh, despite how we all say it, I heard her say her own name and was astonished to hear it, something like Greta Thunberg or something. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I met her at the Declaration of Rebellion in Parliament Square on Halloween. Uh, and you're absolutely right. She's totally fed up with people saying, you know, wow, you're so hopeful and we're so glad that you're doing this because, you know, maybe, maybe it'd be nice if the adults helped a little bit. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, she... Actually, I was I was reading an interview with her the other day that was very striking. I, I mentioned earlier that I'm personally grappling with this sort of uh, my own rift between my sort of social reality and uh, my understanding of, of physical reality. Uh, and it was very interesting that she was talking about the fact that she has Asperger's syndrome and that she sees that as something of a blessing because it means that she couldn't care less about social reality. <laughs> she just really doesn't care at all that everyone else thinks that it's fine to carry on as we are to her as she says it's just really black and white you know if we want to have a future we need to completely transform our economy and our way of life and if that's politically unrealistic well she couldn't care less really you know it's just what needs to happen and people need to get their heads around that and i think for all the uh politicians who tell us that you have to sort of you know triangulate your position and compromise and everything i think people find it deeply refreshing how much she doesn't do that, you know, how much she just stands as a voice of this is what's necessary, this is what we need to do, there's really nothing else to say, <laughs> you know. And so, yeah, I think she's someone who I um, intrinsically have a, have a huge amount of respect for and find deeply refreshing. And I, I saw a figure that over a million children last Friday were out on strike around the world on literally every continent. There's even a research station on Antarctica that was holding a climate strike apparently on Friday. So, it's, yeah, again, it's all part of this work of shifting political reality towards physical reality and, and accepting that only one of those ultimately will full rank. And that's where our allegiance has to lie, because otherwise physics will do the hard work of closing the gap for us. So a young girl pops out of the woodwork not totally invested in the system the way it is, the way we all are. I mean, I expect my next money to come in and I expect to go out and buy some food and I expect to drive my car if I have to go somewhere and, and to have somebody who says, well, I don't expect any of that. I expect to survive and this is what we have to do. That's totally refreshing. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. I, I want to backtrack a little bit, Sean. Nine years ago on Radio EcoShock, it seems like a century ago, you told us about transition groups that were creating their energy descent action plans. I'm wondering, are those working out or were they torn apart by the time going by? That's an interesting question. I have to say I'm not currently actively involved with a local transition group. I was then transitioned down Kingston in South South London, but I moved uh, down to Devon to start a project called the Ecological Land Cooperative. Um, and so I'm not so much involved with transition as I was in the early days. But the best answer I can give you would be that um, it's quite varied, actually. Those energy descent action plans were built on a process called backcasting, which is, say, looking 30 years into the future of your local community and saying, uh, you know, say that you're doing it in 2010, you know, what do we want our community to look like in 2040? And then assuming that it is going to be like that and saying, okay, well, that's what 2040 is going to look like. Well, if it's going to be like that in 2040, what skills and resources and everything else do we need to have in place by 2038 and by 2035 and you kind of work your way back from from the end point sort of throw an anchor into the future and pull yourself along by the chain and then of course by the time you get back to the present day you realize oh god <laughs> we better get to work there's a lot to do and i think that for a lot of places that has been a real catalyst and of course the plan shifts very appropriately over time as, as things unfold and some things happen faster than you'd hope and some things happen slower than you'd hope um, there are certainly a lot of places where that's, yeah, been a massive catalyst. I know of places where the local government have jumped on board with the Energy Descent Action Plan of that community and have got behind it in a full, you know, in a, in a funded way. 
and um, and seen that as a real catalyst. There are other places, of course, where transition is a diverse local movement. You know, the people involved have drifted away or, or, or fallen out. So broadly, I would say that it's to the extent that I can speak for a, a global movement, I would say that it's been a, a pretty successful tool for allowing communities to visualize how they want to respond to the kinds of challenges we face in these times, come together to work on them. And I think in particular, unify two very different kinds of people who care about this stuff. So on the one hand, people who sort of think that we're headed for some kind of collapse scenario and want to prepare for that in some way, want to build resilience towards that future. And on the other hand, people who don't see that coming and just want to make our society a bit more regenerative or sustainable. And Transition seems to have a wonderful ability to bring those two quite different motivations together and work collaboratively on the projects that make sense to both of those perspectives. But I haven't personally revisited a particular energy and action plan and said, you know, okay, like what percentage of this have we achieved? What percentage have we overachieved or underachieved? I have a vague inkling in the back of my mind that uh, Totnes, which was the, the first transition group that developed their full energy development action plan, have a sense that they might have actually done that work a few years ago. Um, there was something called, I think it might be called something like, how are we doing uh, putting transition into numbers or something that looked at all the facts and figures of that. But uh, but yeah, I'd need to look it up. I don't, uh, I don't have the answer to that on the top of my head, unfortunately. Right. I'm going to look it up too, and I'll post it in my blog at ecoshock.org if I can find it. I think that's something we need to do is say, well, okay, it's 10 years on. What has worked? What has not? Uh, What can we advise other people who are going to plunge into this? There's also a question in my mind about whether I will be able to continue in my present role, or you will in yours, or whether we will all be swept away by some really big changes, some unexpected waves that uh, we don't see coming around the corner. Ah, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> will we be hit by something that we can't see coming? <laughs> Inherently hard to say, but uh, um, I mean, I personally think that there's a very meaningful chance that things shift very quickly in, as you say, unpredictable ways. I mean, that tends to be how it is with complex systems. It's, nothing seems to be happening, nothing seems to be happening, nothing seems to be happening, and then poof, falls off a cliff. And there are more and more issues that can't continue as they are very much longer. Um, I mean, there was, looking at ecological reality, there was a report, I think, around the turn of the year that the majority of animals that were on Earth 40 years ago aren't there anymore. You know, that that 60% of the, 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 not the species, but the numbers of creatures, um, there's been a reduction of over, over 50%. And, you know, when you're living in a system that's completely dependent on the ecology and the ecology is screaming that loud that you know that it's that it's falling apart basically that that even even a sort of super abundant system like the natural world is struggling to deal with again economic growth ultimately you know we've got a sort of exponentially growing economy that's dependent on a not exponentially growing life support system uh, it's not surprising that the scientists who study the life support system are telling us that um, that it's having problems. And so there, there, there doesn't seem to be any realistic prospect that things continue as they are for the, I would say, shrinking circle of those who are still living in comfort and talking about, you know, when will the apocalypse come? Uh, I mean, the science, the science fiction writer William Gibson very memorably said, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And, you know, I think the apocalypse, as I was saying before, for the societies, I think for, for human individuals as well, has already come for probably the majority of people on the planet. And it's, it's something of a, a luxury for those of us who are sitting in this sort of shrinking circle of comfort to talk about, you know, whether or not that's going to continue or when the apocalypse might come. To me, looking at it from a more sort of communal point of view, looking at it from a, a human scale point of view, the level of suffering, the level of of misery and, and death that we're seeing already is is immense. So in, in many ways, it's not a question of how long can we continue as we are, because continuing as we are doesn't look remotely desirable to me, or for that matter to Greta Thunberg. The question is, what is the most significant contribution I can make to creating a world in which we're, in which we're proud to live, in which we're, you know, absolutely enjoying ourselves? 
um, absolutely living a life that's filled with community and joy and celebration, because if not, then what's the point? But where that joy and celebration isn't premised on you know, the destruction of the future and, and the, the suffering of the people who are working to produce all the stuff that we're consuming. Um, so really, that's the question for me is not, you know, how sustainable is this society? The question is, how can I best contribute to building a sequel, which is something to be proud of? Something better. Your writing appears in magazines and newspapers and blogs all over, and frankly, I miss some of it. Is there a central place where we can keep up with Well, my website is, as you mentioned, darkoptimism.org, and, yeah, certainly the highlights uh, get posted up there on my, my articles page and on my blog. There's also a mailing list that I send out with my Fleming Policy Centre hat on, um, not only talking about David Fleming's work, but primarily about that. And people can sign up to that. Uh, the easiest link is tinyurl.com slash leanlogic. Um, and if you go there and scroll to the bottom, you'll find the mailing list you can sign up for. Uh, those are probably the two, uh, two best places to keep track of all that I'm up to. It's been really great talking with you, Sean. And Sean Chamberlain is the UK author, journalist, editor, blogger, activist, and as you can see, a, a pretty deep thinker, I think. And we'll find links to some of Sean's rethinks of critical issues in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org and in Sean's blog at darkoptimism.org. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, It's been an absolute pleasure, Alex. I should mention as well, I'm on uh, Twitter at Dark Optimism, which is also another good place to keep up to my my day-to-day meanderings and musings. Well, yes and no. I find that you haven't updated it too often. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's true, actually. The last um, the last month or so, six weeks or so, I've been tweeting a lot less, but that's largely because, as I mentioned, I've been taking a bit of time for getting offline and, and really doing some deeper reflection about what my next chapter might look like. But I suspect the way it tends to work with me is that I have these periods of, of reflection and redirection, and then something comes along which, which really excites me and that I want to throw myself into and when I do that again, I suspect I'll be uh, I'll be telling people about it through Twitter a lot more actively. Well, I should talk. I have a listener who always scolds me that I'm not keeping my Twitter feed going properly. So uh, we all <laughs> we all do what we can, and I also feel the need to unplug from time to time. I go out and uh, either chop wood or uh, get my garden going in order to stay sane in these wild times. But anyway, it's been a joy talking with you, and please come back and let's do it again. I'd love to, Alex. Thanks a lot. As always, you can get all sorts of links for this discussion with Sean Chamberlain in my weekly show blog published every Wednesday at ecoshock.org.